my old leather breeches and my shaggy, shaggy locks. I am walking in the glory of the light, said Fox. Hello, friends. My name is Ellen Brooks, and I'm from the Kickapoo Valley Monthly Meeting in southwestern Wisconsin, which is a small group, and I'm active with the Advancement and Outreach Committee as part of the way that I like to make contact with friends in a larger area and just a larger number of friends, since our meeting only consists of uh, five or five to eight people every Sunday. Um, I'm here with uh, approximately 220 other friends from the Northern Yearly Meeting area, which covers Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, eastern part of Iowa, the UP of Michigan, and when they can join us, friends from North Dakota and one meeting in South Dakota. Um, we're here at Luther Park Bible Camp and near Chatech, Wisconsin, from Thursday through Sunday, September 20th through 23rd. 1990, and friends of some friends started gathering Thursday night. Others joined us Friday and today Saturday, and we'll be dispersing on Sunday tomorrow. There are 75 children that are involved in this particular session of the yearly meeting. They were in attendance with us at the meeting for worship this morning for approximately 20 minutes and it was wonderful to see all of them there together and then they dispersed to their various programs uh, each age group having a different set of teachers and program that they're working with throughout the yearly meeting session Friends find it important to get together twice a year uh, in our yearly meeting sessions for conducting the business of the yearly meeting and for our spiritual growth through workshops and worship sharing and uh, being in this beautiful setting here in Luther Park uh, right next to a large lake and with uh, beautiful woods all around us and fairly rustic setting but um, with some heated cabins and um, the nice large dining hall uh, which can accommodate all of us in one sitting. Um, in addition to the cabins there's also camping here at um, as there is in, at all of our NYM sessions which is a part of the way that we try to encourage um, people that might have a little more trouble paying for the cabins um, to be able to camp and, and uh, people with families or just those of us who like to uh, camp appreciate that opportunity. Um, another aspect of encouraging people to come is that uh, the scholarship the scholarships are available to come to NYM simply by um, totaling up what your fees would be and then subtracting what you feel that you need help with and um, then that's just automatically uh, appropriated so that anyone, uh, we hope that everyone will be able to come to NYM without regard to uh, financial problems. In addition to the meeting business and also our uh, attention to our spiritual growth, of course the fellowship uh, with other friends from widely scattered areas is really important to a lot of us and, and of course those who have attended will be glad to see friends that they've met at other sessions and those who are new will be taken in as newfound friends and have an opportunity to experience uh, meeting for worship and also other interactions with friends on what's usually a larger scale than any of our monthly meetings or worship groups can provide. We try to combine um, encouraging lots of people to come with also trying to keep a, a somewhat informal and casual atmosphere and, and situation so that people can feel comfortable meeting with smaller groups of people within the larger body that meets together as Northern Yearly Meeting. To help us put Northern Yearly Meeting into historical perspective, Raquel Wood asked several friends to form a panel to share some of their past NYM experiences. 
<clears throat> for many of us who uh, have been to yearly meeting, whether we are newcomers or have been coming for five or ten years or some of us old timers, we tend to think about the yearly meeting as we um, first came to it. And this is the way it is and it always was because it's our experience of it. But this evening we're going to go back <clears throat> and look at the origins of our yearly meeting a little bit. And uh, for, it would be a good idea for people to uh, keep in mind that we first began as a quarterly meeting, an Illinois yearly meeting. And at a later time, about 1960, we moved from being a quarterly meeting to being a half yearly meeting under the care of Illinois yearly meeting. It wasn't until 1975 that we actually became an independent monthly meeting, independent yearly meeting. Each of the people who's going to speak here will have some reflections about their own experience uh, in the yearly meeting. Yeah, we were becoming more and more numerous as the uh, local meetings in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and uh, were uh, uh, growing at the very, uh, particularly at near the various university and college campuses, and so that the population of attenders at Illinois Union meeting really got out of hand. 350, uh, we would have, and uh, you had to have double uh, <clears throat> sittings at and meals, the place was not really adequate for that kind of numbers. Now that we have separated, which was a painful process, as you indicated, to give up that connection was difficult. And to, found, to form Northern Yearly Meeting, it was, it was inevitable, as growth requires. Uh, but now they're down to about uh, somewhere between 200 and 250 in attendance, and many of their meetings Illinois Union meetings are, are quite small and haven't gotten the growth that a number of our meetings have. But, um, you know, I don't think, I, I, I think it's important to remember that as we founded Northern Yearly Meeting, we, we were blessed with this background of Illinois Yearly Meeting, with their blessing and uh, with this, the energy that uh, we had and, and dream. Uh, that, they, that we had learned at uh, the Illinois Yearly Meeting. Our Northern Yearly Meeting was for us just having fellowship because uh, we, uh, our son, for instance, for three days had just played um, basketball. Nothing, nothing else. Not, did not attend great discussion groups, but just had support by suddenly feel, a min, a meeting some other young people who uh, had the same kind of parents. Parents who were not of the mainstream. And uh, I think that gave them great, great support. I was... Um about 13 when my parents joined the Twin Cities Friends meeting. And I went to, I guess it, this was previous to the formation of half yearly, northern half yearly meeting even, but I went to a gathering at the O'Kellar County Youth Camp. Um, we were a half yearly meeting by then. Was it? Okay. Um, back in, what, 65 or, or something. Um, I was 13. And the only thing that I really remember about it was that I was quite shy and I didn't feel like I fit in. And I, I kind of wondered why I was there. Um, well, then when I was a uh, high school age kid, um, I fit in quite well. And I had a real uh, crowd that I came to Northern Yearly Meeting gatherings, which were down in Frontenac at that point, uh, to, to be with. And as I recall, there wasn't much of a program. An older person might remember that there was quite a bit of program planning, but I don't remember that. So um, what I remember is, is uh, tuning into my age group, and that, that was very important to me. Um, I did feel kind of like, uh, you know, because of the anti-war, you know, stuff going on and all those things, uh, you know, in that time in the 60s that um, I was kind of a loner in my high school. Nobody else had, uh, well, actually, 
maybe three people in my civics class had heard of Vietnam. The other two were all for what we were doing, and well, it was my job to be against what we were doing. And, um, and so it was important to me to come down and, uh, to Northern Yearly Meeting and connect. Oh, I don't, I don't oh, remember. Oh, it was a long time ago at Frontenac. I yeah, mean, it, was, it, was, when it was at Frontenac. Yeah, we were about eight, and you know, we charged people a nickel or a quarter to come in and see all these shells that we'd collected. And so it, it felt really good. It felt like we were really doing something for our community, you know. And um, <laughs> so that that sense of, of um, those friendships and the community that, that we built then has really lasted very well. And this, I'm kind of wondering what it's going to be like this year because all those people have gone away to college and aren't going to be here. And so. Yeah, I guess also in thinking about um, thinking about NYM, I it's kind of what's kept me going a lot of times, um, especially through junior high. That's a real hard time in people's lives, I think, a lot. And this was something that I kind of held on to through the rest of my normal life. You know, was well, I've got I've got NYM, I've got those people, and and so that's really helped me through a lot of really hard times. And <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it, really. Good. Well. I'm Joan Downs. I just moved here from Hartford, Connecticut, and I was just going to share a little bit about New England Yearly Meeting, which is very different. Um, it happens the second week of August. It's about 600 or 700 people. It takes place on Amherst Cam campus um, of Amherst College, and we're looking for a new place because we're getting too big. There's also a site committee for that. We have a um, meeting for speaking on Saturday afternoon. And it goes from Saturday afternoon through Thursday morning. Um, meeting for business in the morning, preceded by half hour of Bible study and worship groups. Um, and workshops in the afternoon. And one evening of business. And committees meet throughout that week and also throughout the year. It's very expensive. It's about 150 to $200. Um, and getting scholarships is difficult because it's so expensive. Uh, and one of the things when I visited last year was the wonderful policy, if you need a scholarship, write it, write one. And I was very impressed with that and also impressed with the hands-on work that has happened here um, in terms of getting everything done. Um, that's very different, but I really like that. I'm glad to be here again. Good. I first came in 1981. Janet Anderson. Janet Anderson. I live in Twin Cities. Um, the clearest memory I have is that before breakfast on Saturday, there was a flagpole outside the dining hall, and it had a little, um, little rock wall with flowers planted inside. And Rosalie and a couple of other people were out there, and they were singing hymns before breakfast. And that was like, I was thinking about going to Africa or India or running off to somewhere. It was like, no, this is where I want to be. <laughs> in the fall of 70, there was discussion about becoming a yearly meeting. And people were saying, well, if we become a yearly meeting, it'll do this to us. And other people were saying, no, no, it won't do that. It'll do this other thing to us. And it'll have these good effects. It'll have these bad effects. And um, nothing was decided. And when I came back in fall of 74 and walked into the meeting for business, I heard all the same arguments. <laughs> and I said, well, why don't we have a committee to propose a structure so we can all debate about the same thing. So naturally, I got stuck on the committee. <laughs> but, but a year later, we had a yearly meeting. And uh, Lila and Elliot Cornell, whom Barbara talked about before, they were the chairs of that committee. And they did their work. And I'm Phil Mounts from the Fox Valley meeting. I just, I just remembered uh, of an occasion that uh, my friend Dick Turk uh, uh, taught me uh, something about Quakerism. Uh, it was one of the, uh, the meetings that 
one of the more primitive uh, centers. I recall there, there being a, a big barn of a room with no windows that were closed on it. And uh, probably because of the spring meeting, because it was over in the eastern part of Wisconsin. And the meeting for worship was quite popcorny. Uh, people were hopping up very frequently. And Dick finally stood up and uh, gave a short message and continued to stand and continued to stand and continued to stand. Finally, someone else thought there was something the matter with Dick and stood up and started to speak. And <laughs> Dick said, friend, I have not finished yet. <laughs> Well, whether this this is is um, fair since the goals aren't here, but at the yearly meeting in Frontenac, <clears throat> when the whole subject was up for discussion, Speed was clerk, and the chief opponent of the whole idea was her son. And I it it impressed me that this woman never lost her cool. She was not ever going to tell him to shut up. <laughs> she listened to everything he had to say and gave him every opportunity to express himself. And if ever I saw a, a, a fine Quaker attitude, she was the person who, who displayed that. She was wonderful. This evening we've heard a number of people talk about what it has meant in a kind of social way for uh, their own enjoyment with other people who come together at the yearly meeting. And also we've heard from young people about how important it was for them to find their community in the yearly meeting. One of the things that I have valued very much as a parent is to have my children exposed to wonderful, wonderful people here at the yearly meeting so that their experience with Quaker adults has broadened their lives a great deal. And I'm particularly grateful that Francis <clears throat> was taking care of kids back in 1964 at Wausau when I brought my children there. They were about maybe uh, seven and 11 years, seven and 10 years old. And Francis made a very big impression on them and they have just always admired and liked him and one to this day continues to be his friend so that I feel very grateful for those kinds of connections and I know probably every child who came to yearly meeting probably has their own favorite adults whom they have related to I think this is a really important function of the yearly meeting after breakfast worship sharing groups meet this year, in addition to worship sharing, we also had Bible study and hymn singing during this time period. And then we gather for meeting for worship. After meeting for worship, we shift into meeting for business. Usually, the meeting for business opens with an epistle reading from one of the other yearly meetings. In modern times, we have sought to continue this 300-year tradition of friendship by, lear by learning from Aboriginal people and working with them when requested. Canadian Quakers, through contacts of individuals, through participation in the Aboriginal Rights Coalition, and Canadian Alliance in Solidarity with Native Peoples, and through our own Quaker Committee on Native Concerns, have sought to continue that tradition. We reaffirm our support for these people and other constructive efforts for justice and for Canada's First Nations and their oppressed peoples. The epistle is one way for us to keep in touch with a larger, wider body of friends. 
Another way that we like to do this is to have reports from our representatives to various Friends national organizations. Jim Lewis reported on the Friends World Committee on Consultation. Uh, they were discussing one project in particular in El Salvador in which uh, uh, rate sharing helped to fund the building of a well as a source of clean and dependable water. And so now this community does have its own well and uh, it was said that uh, government forces came in from El Salvador and uh, they are welcome to refresh themselves there at the well and drink water and then later on after uh, the, the government troops moved out, rebel forces moved in and uh, they also offered them water from this new well and uh, so it, it, was, it was not only a source of water but a way of expressing love. Virginia Toll, who was visiting us from the Friends World Committee for consultation, added her observations from visiting friends in Kenya. There was an Anglican bishop who, was, who spoke out against the government during early August or end of July, and he has since been killed. This has stirred up a lot of emotions in the country. And of course, there have been other people with less prominence, including a well-known attorney who also spoke up and came to this country under the refuge of our embassy. My sense is that there are friends in Parliament, there are friends in various levels of government throughout the country, and with the violence that occurs oftentimes to people who speak up and, and to hear, they disappear or they are killed. And, and if we as church people as a body speak out, we end up putting them in danger, which they have chosen not to do. It's a very delicate situation, and I think we have to leave it to Kenyan friends to advise us what to be done. But John Greenler, our representative to the American Friends Service Committee, also reported. The AFSC has been responding, uh, rapidly responding to the Persian Gulf crisis on several levels. First off, um, there's been direct communication with involved governments by the service committee. Um, but I think more importantly, the service committee has also been very involved in organizing grassroots responses at the community level by provide, providing all sorts of different types of services, which I can put um, people in touch with. In both of these avenues, the service committee has stressed a position uh, on the long-range issues in the region sort of taking the broad perspective of how did we get where we are now and how do we begin to uh, move out of the present situation, where not just in terms of the immediate crisis, but in terms of the whole region. Um, and I'll, at this time, I was originally planning on responding in a broader fashion on that, but I think I'm going to hold off if we're going to have a meeting in more detail regarding the Persian Gulf crisis. After meetings for worship and for worship with attention to business, we have lunch. Friends are involved in the preparation of food under the supervision of a cook who is hired by the planning committee. And after lunch, then there's cleanup to do. All friends are asked to volunteer for two different jobs, uh, one either with cleanup, camp cleanup or in the kitchen, and one with the children and youth program. The children and youth program is organized by our committee, but um, it depends heavily on volunteers to be carried out with the um, numbers of children that are participating in the session. I want to make sure that they all receive the love and attention that they deserve too. <clears throat> then following lunch and the cleanup, there's free time, which sometimes is taken up by committee meetings and uh, basically is an open time for uh, friends to enjoy the out of doors if the weather is nice, which it's not been too much this weekend. Um, we, can, we have canoes available for people to go canoeing and there's swimming in the swimming pool. It's a little bit chilly for that this weekend. but. Some other sessions uh, 
the swimming area is a nice place for families or um, just individuals to have a chance to relax and interact with one another. And of course there's always the uh, intense conversations either over the meal that extend on into the afternoon or um, taking a walk together or whatever. time we have workshops on seven different topics having to do with the theme of this yearly meeting session where have we been where are we going and how are we going to get there to introduce the topics one speaker from each workshop spoke before the first session to give us an idea about the concerns each workshop should discuss the small groups met on Friday and Saturday then on Sunday a reporter from each workshop told the meeting for business about conclusions, new ideas, and some actions recommended to be taken. To keep something of the flow of ideas, the three phases of work on each topic will be presented together. Um, the first person we'll hear from is Mary Snyder talking about the spiritual life of the yearly meeting. I like it when we come to yearly meeting and we leave time in the schedule for the spirit to move so that we're not so programmed in that someone who has a strong leading, who has a concern, can't be heard. And many times we have spaces so that people can come and lead a workshop and meet other people that have similar leadings and similar concerns. All of these are grounded in the spirit. At the same time, I think that, that Northern Yearly Meeting really does feel spiritually grounded. Maybe we want to look at some things that other yearly meetings are doing to help nurture individuals spiritually. Um, at Baltimore Yearly Meeting, there was a great emphasis on different people's spiritual paths. They recorded ministers at Baltimore Yearly Meeting and spent a fair amount of time um, contemplating people's spiritual lives. Baltimore is both Friends General Conference and FUM, so I suspect that part of that came from their background. After, uh, after a false start, we, we hit on a, a uh, Quaker dialogue or worship sharing format, and people were asked to share with the group their own experiences of God acting through their lives. And we were really amazed and, and moved about the diversity um, of experience. And it was incredible that we had diversity of experience without disparity of experience. And, and um, also the openness of the sharing, uh, considering that many of the people had never seen each other before, um, was marvelous. And we knew that we really couldn't communicate the, that, kind, that aspect of it very well to the group, but we knew also that some very clear messages uh, did emerge. And one of them is, um, it was consistently apparent that the power of, the, of a gathered meeting for worship really is the core of our spiritual life in Northern Yearly Meeting. And second, that this power can spill over into every corner of day-to-day of -day life. And the reason for that is because friends' worship is the, the waiting, the listening of still, still spirits of the group. Uh, and that can happen any time in any place. Even if it just happens for a few seconds, it's still friends' worship. I'll rest <coughs> next as Phil Mounts to speak on issues in Quaker organizations. The following are the questions under my Issues and Organizations topic. 
What are Quaker concerns? How does Northern Yearly Meeting deal with them, procedurally as well as action-wise? How does an issue get to be a Northern Yearly Meeting focus? Is it an individual interest, a groundswell, a concern from a constituent meeting, or from the executive committee? Who continues to address the concern over time? Could NYM have a stronger impact by more carefully focusing energy on fewer concerns? How is NYM involved with other Quaker organizations? And is this uh, relationship satisfactory? Would Northern Yearly Meeting be asking, polling the monthly meetings, or would they be polling the individuals within the monthly meetings? Well, I was actually thinking of something that you could do. It wouldn't be a formal a survey, but sort of at Northern Yearly Meeting, you could do it, you know, hand out these pages the first night and do the results the next day, you know. Somebody at a computer could do that. I'm, I'm not uh, clear on how you're hooking this up with the uh, our relationship with organizations like AFSC. Yeah, I, so then we could have questions about FWCC. Um, I am interested terrifically not at all or something like that. So War Warren's com comment was uh, trying to shorthand it that we, we uh, uh, try to bring issue oriented people from various meetings together and your response to that so I can get it down was that uh, uh, there ought to be some vehicle within the meetings so that uh, people with issues can put them forward and say I'd like to see this uh, within put the into the hopper at a uh, yearly meeting. I don't think I'm set on where it has to be. I just was thinking that it would be something that would be. I know. I think it, it was a good idea that uh, our monthly meeting did that. Had a survey for anyone who was interested to fill out and say what issues that they they wanted the peace and social conservative group to pursue. And I Another question in the program was who continues to address the concern over time. In discussion of this question, we concluded that there was need for a larger measure of review by the Northern Meeting, Yearly Meeting sessions of past concerns which have been translated into uh, action or support. The reports of the representatives are one method of review which is presently in use. The understanding of the Finance Committee is another. Over time, uh, our Renewal of the perception of the goals of the organizations we support in our budget could probably benefit from a bit more light, but uh, we did not find a need for concern in depth on this issue. Um, what we're suggesting is that uh, some audit and uh, review of the uh, roughly 30 percent of our budget, which goes to support past concerns, is in order. Again, a two-tiered system might eliminate the uh, uh, groups we support at the lower level. It might illuminate. <laughs> trying to get the light involved here. Uh, we might put it out in the process. <laughs> it might illuminate the uh, groups we support at the lower levels of front. The governing structure is the organization that allows us to do the business of the yearly meeting. Mary has set us in a firm direction that the business of the yearly meeting is that business to which God calls us. Deciding what that business is, is a spiritual concern. It's a concern that, re that reflects organizations that are part of the wider Quaker family. How do we at Northern Yearly Meeting right now, how have we organized ourselves to make decisions? What are the problems we now face and are those problems related to structure or not? Could changes in structure 
make a difference in how we discern God's will, in how we conduct our business, in how we sit in meeting for business. We recommended that we thought a continuing committee would be very important. Uh, the union meeting turned it down. It seemed to me the main reason was they just didn't want another committee. I wonder if we could, again, pick it. it looks like we've got communications, uh, structure of the continuing or representative body, and whether or not we're going to have some sort of geographical uh, groupings. I wonder if we could take those one at a time and just deal with them instead of keep bouncing these things. We're missing something critical from the list before we start talking about the list we made, and that's something that came up early, and, and that is um, form follows function, and we're talking about our structure and how to make it, and we haven't given any discussion to <laughs> what are we about. And I was hoping that that would be a bigger part of our discussion. Um, maybe our structure is all right and it needs some fine tuning. And as we grow, we'll know more about whether it's all right or not. It took a long time to decide we're going to be a yearly. But I think it's only after we decide what it is we're trying to do that we can make that decision. We had a good attendance at the governing structure meeting. And um, it was interesting in, in respect to things um, that we didn't address as well as those that we did address. Um, we didn't really talk about the meeting for worship for business and seemed to feel that things needed to be um, conducted in a way other than what we're doing um, at this moment. I, I, I'm not sure you could really read that as an endorsement of what we're doing right now, but um, nobody seemed to feel that there were any problems with that. Um, our process was to begin with um, answering the question, what is the business of Northern Yearly Meeting? And um, many of us were impressed with what I believe Sne Steve Snyder had presented on um, a, a previous business meeting session and um, was, at, was quoting from a 1982 Northern Yearly Meeting budget report that the goals of Northern Yearly Meeting are to nurture our local meetings, to encourage and provide support of Northern Yearly Meeting leaders or leadership, to nurture fellowship of a wider circle of friends within our geographic area, to support friends organizations both nationally and locally to further our Quaker concerns, to support the education of our children specifically about Quakerism, and lastly support of new meeting houses and um, sufferings of individuals through our sufferings fund. I'd like to just tell you a little bit about what's interesting about children and youth and what we're going to be doing from 4 to 5 today and from 03 to 5 or so tomorrow. <clears throat> children and youth is faced with the interesting uh, prospect each yearly meeting session of figuring out what we can do for our children and youth this session besides provide more than adequate daycare <laughs> and also we um, have fun treading the line between you know meaningful and fun uh, children and youth is also kind of charged with the larger responsibility of, well, what is the yearly meeting supposed to be doing for children and youth as opposed to what their parents are supposed to be doing, their aunts and uncles, their Quaker non-godparents, their meetings, their schools, so on. Um, one of the things that um, we have been particularly concerned with in the last couple of years is what our youth program should look like. The purpose we set up for this meeting was not to discuss the rules, but was for um, designing a new system for governing the retreats and the program and everything. And uh, I think we're going to get nowhere if we if we just uh, scream and yell at each other about about what the rules are going to be and, and whether or not the rules are right or wrong. But if we just put all our time and energy um, and just come to a consensus about what we should, uh, how we should deal with with the rules in the future. 
that actually uh, confront the issue of the rules will do a lot better. It would be helpful to me to uh, know, and there may be different perspectives on this, what the uh, rule setting process has been in the recent past. That's sort of what I was going to say because I was going to say I don't know how you made your rules, so I will just tell you what I had in my head as to the way I thought something like a Northern Year Union group of young people and adults should make rules. Hi, I'm Luke Greenley from Madison Meeting. Um, as some of you may know, I'll put a little background here. We've had a little problems with the uh, teen program and the Children's Youth Committee in that uh, some things that are going around, um, the teens don't feel they're getting enough input <coughs> into the program. So we had a meeting today, yesterday and today, and we discussed this long and hard. And um, we came up with a statement. We meant to discuss the needs of youth within NYM. From a brainstorm list of 27 needs, we selected those we feel NYM should focus on trying to meet. We suggested specific actions to meet these six needs. Respect, acceptance, special quality of peers, spiritual involvement, choices, and access to knowledge. A teen planning committee is being formed to participate in program planning and evaluation to set and enforce guidelines and to hear complaints and give reports. Then uh, the adults left. <laughs> and then we started to get something done. We uh, are suggesting a committee, uh, a teen planning committee that would be a subcommittee of the Children and Youth Committee, would have uh, four to five youth members, including uh, members from both the high school and the junior high programs, as well as parents uh, of youth here at NYM and non-parents. Another area that once you have the budget, you have to implement it. And that, I think, is where we run into most of our problems, really, is how do you write guidelines that will fairly and equitably distribute the resources and help people do the things that they do that the budget supports. Uh, we, we wrestled with that for years. Uh, there are some areas we've done pretty well in developing guidelines. There are some, like the request for travel, that I think still give us a fair amount of difficulty, trying to know how to allocate travel funds uh, especially this new supplemental travel fund has used up hours of time at the executive committee and the budget committee trying to figure that out. So that's probably something we'll be talking about uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. Rather than have the, all that administrative detail come back to your meeting for discussion and approval that the budget committee is authorized to do it. Then if and it's publicized and if people have difficulties, it can be discussed, of course, if you're like this. You're right. It is for yeah. governance. We recommend that the budget committee be authorized to drop and adopt guidelines and procedures for administering the budget. Okay, good. Joe Lansberger from Twin City Friends Meeting. Um, four friends participated. Steve Snyder, uh, Lucy Holtzimer, Jim Lund, and Joe Lansberger, myself. Uh, it was an interesting group in that one participant was from a newly formed meeting and the others from established. Two of the members were treasurers, two non-treasurers, and so we had a good discussion. Uh, by introduction, well actually, in worship sharing this morning, somebody told me we were discussing the goals and objectives of the Northern Yearly Meeting. And somebody said, well, who wrote these up? And somebody said, the Budget Committee, <laughs> which kind of gave me a shock because this is the prepared statement that we had written pre prior to that. Uh, we believe that the budget flows from the needs and concerns of Northern Yearly Meeting and its constituent monthly meetings, which is completely opposite of what was originally done, I guess. Furthermore, that the budget, as it reflects these needs and concerns, will be affected by the current evaluative process. So, that was kind of our presupposition. Then we went on to express 
several concerns and even queries regarding the process. First, as regards communication. With improved communication, we can gain a more accurate count of members for budgeting. For example, the figure average contribution toward Northern Yearly Meeting is based upon this count. We stress average since new meetings members may not be able to contribute at this level and even should not be expected to do so. Second, with improved communication, meetings and worship groups will gain a better sense of identity and return for their contributions, both in terms of human resources and monetary. They will also be more likely to participate and contribute. For example, as of today, one-third of meetings and worship groups financially contribute to Northern Yearling Meeting budget of this year. I'd like to, first of all, uh, change the name communication to a phrase called the Ministry of Communication. I truly do see this, the aspects of communication as a ministry, especially within this particular gathering of friends, the yearly meeting. As you know, today is Friday and we're expecting more people tonight. But in this room sits only about 55 to 658 people, depending on when you count. Well, people moving in and out because of a variety of reasons. Um, there is a lot more to yearly meeting than us 55. There are, according to your last count, budget knows this, 450. Now there's a reasons why there isn't 450 people here. And each one, of course, has a variety of reasons. Um, but that does give us an obligation, not only to communicate between us 55, but also to communicate with the, the total 450 and do it well. And I feel that we don't do it well. Yeah, I don't know. Like, others, you know, others, very quiet. You know, if you were a representative, or asked to be representative from the meeting, I don't know what you're talking about. Worship sharing. Any ideas? Well, in our meeting, um, when people come to uh, their meeting, or if they go to Friends General Conference, that's, they always report back. During the meeting for business? No, uh, they take a, a Sunday all oh. alone for the second hour, and it's announced on the news center. It's a special program mm -hmm. every time. Our meeting's really, really respectful of. Okay. And if somebody says, yes, I can go to yearly meeting, everybody does everything but applaud them. However, I, I don't think we've ever talked about representatives. There could be several different ways of presenting um, what you did or what happened mm -hmm. while you were there. All of this is important to, to help build community. the community of Northern Union Meeting, or all of us, is in a sense of common sharing, and I think it's important to you. I can just see how important it is for our family to come back and say this is what we right. did, mm -hmm. and help, in a sense, encourage others to attend the next gathering. Mm -hmm. Others. Where does this fit? I, mean, I haven't figured it out yet, mm -hmm. but it seems like somehow the, the, the individual Quaker and that monthly meeting has to have a sense of what is this to our Quaker life, going to yearly meeting? Mm -hmm. And then, it seems as if you get that straight, then the rest will go as it should. First of all, uh, we are recommending to the yearly meeting that uh, we establish a, a position of representative to Northern Yearly Meeting ad hoc. And this would be trying to meet up with the problem that many meetings have forgotten of the tradition of sending representatives to the yearly meeting, and that this needs to be reintroduced and recognized as a significant opportunity for monthly meetings and worship groups to officially recognize and connect with Northern Yearly Meeting. Uh, as far as the possibilities in, uh, of so solving this, we're asking Northern Yearly Meeting and the Advancement Outreach Committee to ask monthly meetings to send representatives to Northern Yearly Meeting, and that it be minuted as such, that this be something that we are asking of all worship groups and all uh, meetings, in prepare, preparative meetings or monthly meetings. Um, Ann Fisher will speak to us on 
of sessions planning. When I started thinking about what to talk about about sessions, I, it got, became very complex instantly because it seems whoever I sit down with to talk about sessions has about five new ideas that I haven't heard about that all sound really good. And it's getting to the point where we have this vast selection in front of us and no one selection is right. Uh, and so it's very hard to figure out what are the main issues that we have to deal with. And, and again, talking about dealing with the imperfections. And I think that the other challenge we have before us is, is separating, separating and dealing with the practical and emotional aspects. Partially, how many times a year are we going to meet? And this is an issue which brings up a lot as far as emotions, but in some sense may practically have already been decided for us. Uh, I think it's almost inevitable, personally, that we're going to end up going to a once a year yearly meeting for a lot of reasons, partially what has been stated, what's called burnout or whatever, that we don't have the staff to put it on twice a year. Part of what I'm going to present also goes into some of the process that we went through, but I think it's important. We meant to address the questions of when, where, and how does Northern Yearly Meeting meet next year? We spoke from our experiences in planning and attending NYM sessions, recognizing the value of each perspective. At first, we felt tension. The pulls and tugs of our different needs and perspectives, and the difference between our wants and our resources. We tried to keep before us the question, are our logistical needs, such as numbers of people attending and costs of attending, getting more priority than non-logistical needs, which would be what's really important here. We generated a needs list, everything from the need for fellowship to having nightingales. The needs list showed us that what was most crucial about NYM sessions could be maintained with either one or two yearly sessions. These crucial areas included for us worship, business, fellowship, youth programs, and minimal expense in attending. Our focus then became the question of resources. What can we do with the money and people energy available to us? We concluded that we do not have these resources consistently, and therefore our recommendation is we recognize the importance we place on two sessions, but lacking consistent resources, we recommend we try one session in 1991. The monkey's just a squit, squit, scratching, and they're swinging through the trees, and a squit, squit, scratching, and they're hanging by their tails, and a squit, squit, scratching, and a we can stay all day. We're going to the zoo, zoo, zoo. Supper is followed by some kind of intergenerational activity. Friday night, we made a campfire and sang songs and told stories. Saturday night, we had a square dance in the dining hall with live music. They are. You are. While the square dancing continued in the dining hall, a group in the chapel gathered for the soapbox, an opportunity for anyone to speak on any subject. Marty Grundy from the Friends General Conference intrigued her audience with her observations on Quaker theology. And the other piece of our mission 
is to invite people, including ourselves, to more, to deepening our faith. This is scary stuff. This is uh, stepping off the good old familiar. This is, as I've mentioned once before, to come near God is to change. And change is always risky and often painful. Sometimes it's lonely. But I think we need to explore, learn about, reach towards whatever it was that powered those early friends. Now, I'm not saying that we should become 17th century friends. That's not it at all. But what was it that made them tick? Is that power, that authenticity, available to us? And I would say, yes, it is. Right. And, and I feel a real um, sort of a, uh, a lack of, of uh, clear direction in terms of, and people who seem to have, uh, um, I'm not sure thought about it, uh, who know the practices and can pass them on as you do uh, you know, tea from cup to cup, because I think that's what it's about. And the, the cups are going to look different over the years, but somehow it seems to me we haven't talked much about those kind of things. Yes, it's, you put your finger on a, on a real problem. However, we aren't without help. Uh, there's an, uh, maybe per capita, friends write more about themselves than any other group. I'm not sure, maybe Jews do, I don't know, but there's, there's an awful lot of good friend stuff. In the old days, just because of this problem, because friends were quite clear we had no creed, so how do you learn how to be a Quaker? Well, one way is to look for a Quaker and follow him around, which is an excellent way. But the only trouble is, it's hard to find a real Quaker. <laughs> so one of the things that I have done is going back through history and found my Quakers. Woolman, Fox. Those are just the two most accessible, or the most uh, widely available. Fox's journal may not be all that accessible. <laughs> when the soapbox closed, the nightingales sang on into the late night. If you a pistol, will you fight for the Lord? No, you can't kill the devil with a gun or a sword. Will you swear on the Bible? I will not, said he, for the truth is more holy than the book to me. Walk in the light wherever you may be. Walk in the light wherever you may be. In my old leather breeches and my shaggy, shaggy locks, I am walking in the glory of the light, said Fox. Um, the Advancement and Outreach Committee um, asked Jack Tiffany to make this video so that and do the editing on it so that we could both carry it with us as we go to, um, as we come to visit you and also um, send it to groups that are further away and where friends may never have um, been able to send a representative uh, from a small group um, or even if there had been in the past uh, that friends might want to know what had happened at this session in particular since we are focusing specifically on our yearly meeting and we're hoping that this um, video will be a way of connecting you with us and us with you so that we so that you will have a better understanding of what happened here and if you have questions or um, comments that you want to make we'd be very happy to hear from you and um, hope that you'll also let us know what you think about this as, as a way of um, increasing our, our contact with one another. It's hard to make a trip all the way to North Dakota from Wisconsin either direction and so we're hoping that this will provide some of that contact.